Welcome, everyone, to Charting Change in Legal. I am Ari Kaplan, an analyst that covers the legal industry, and I am here with my co-host, Caroline Hill. Hi, everyone. I am the editor of Legal IT Insider. I'm based in the UK, uh, and great to be with you here, Ari, chatting in our regular podcast. I love these discussions. I love the authenticity of them. I love the fun that we have, and I'm always super interested to see what you're hearing, to, to, to learn what you're hearing there and to share what I'm seeing here, which I think is a super fun aspect of this discussion. So, you know, tell me what you've been doing over the last couple of weeks. Gosh. So, well, I think that you were kind enough to notice um, when we published this this week that I have launched an event. Uh, it's called the Say Gap, which is we didn't come up with the term, but we I think we're the only event around it. It's the Say Gap is a play on the pay gap, um, which we are teaching people to speak in public, which um, this first one that we're doing on the 1st of December is for women in the legal and legal tech sector, not just legal tech, where you and I probably play the most. Um, and we are teaching women to give mini TED Talks um, because a lot of people that I approach are not comfortable putting themselves forward to be contribute to articles or panels. You know, we, we're obviously constantly combating the manner. Um, and I just thought, you know, how can I, how can I help both for the women themselves so that they can be confident but also for the next generations because obviously you need role models so the statistics when you see the number of people coming into the profession who are women it's actually equal in the UK certainly but then when you get to equity partner 25 percent of equity partners are women and then when you look at the legal tech sector in an sort of our area um, the number of female CIOs is negligible. And what's interesting, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Since I started in 2014, the numbers have gone down and they continue to go down. Um, so whilst there's lots of room for we, 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 we want to be clear that, you know, I know there seems to be a lot of initiatives for women. And we, you know, our ambition is perhaps the next one will be to do with um you know, we could we can use this for all sorts of diversity. Um, but this first one is a passion project of mine to try and get more women to stand up, more women to be counted. Um, and I'm working with an organisation called Ginger Leadership Communications. They are awesome. Um, and they're going to come in and do these workshops. And then at the end of the day, women will get to some women will present to their groups and some will stand up on stage and give a mini TED talk, um, which is going to be awesome. So years ago, I had to do something with a train the trainer. It was a, I was teaching a course in a college and it was it was on, on, on a business law course and I had to give a presentation like this. And I was very nervous because, you know, you take a little bit of training on speaking or 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 teaching even and then you have to get up and do something it's challenging are you going to give people a chance to come up with a topic in advance or will they have to just do it on the fly there it's a good question so so the sarah the person from ginger who's leading this we're lucky to have her she's called sarah lloyd hughes and one of the things that resonated with the way that she talks about public speaking is she mm. says about finding what you connect with and speaking with authenticity which for me was one of it really was meaningful and that's one of the things I'm excited about because I can stand up in front of a room of people but she's talking about it's a word she uses authenticity like really connect with what you're talking about which makes you a, goes from make, being a, a someone who can stand up and say words to somebody who's a great speaker um, and so I think she's going to help part of the training will be helping people to find things that they want to talk about and that they connect with and therefore they can deliver in a passionate way how many minutes is it do you know what was so um in theory it the TED, people use ted in a lot of different ways <laughs> and and sometimes it means you know 10 to 15 minutes or whatever sometimes it means three minutes so people say oh, it's yeah. ted style meaning i just get up there and i don't spend an hour you know just going on and on so is there a time frame <laughs> It's going to be we we won't have time for everyone to do a proper TED talk. It's more about 
these some people who come will be good already and it will be learning more some people are really terrified of speaking full stop and so you know it's, so for the people who are already good it will be like I can speak but for me I want to get better right so for me it would be that learning from Sarah everything I can about you know I don't know everything but then for some people it will be truly terrifying um so I I don't think I mean it's going to be minutes it's not going to be everyone going to have an hour to present because we've only got a day but some people will present on stage which is really cool um I so love it I remember yeah. I remember when I was asked to I had to speak but I, the point was to teach the room something so I had to come up with something and nobody gave us any advance notice and so my first thought was to teach people how to make a smoothie because I love a, <laughs> have, I love a smoothie. And right, it's immediately funny. It's like it immediately disarms you. It's like, well, there's no way you can really get this wrong. And, <laughs> you know, bananas and blueberries and, you know, almond milk or whatever your choice is. And like, who likes almond milk? And, you know, it's just sort of this whole experiential <laughs> uh, endeavor. Although I, I have a technique that I wonder, I'm so curious to hear how this goes because I'm so interested in how people teach public speaking. I have often found that because everybody is nervous, there's no one that gets up in front of a room, especially if it's a large room of people and isn't anxious. And the first thing I always, always do is I ask the audience a question. Right. You know, and I don't ask, you know, how are you doing or anything? I ask a very specific question, like how many people, how many people here have ever been to Canary Wharf or, you know, whatever. And then it'll, it'll, there'll be a point to that. And then I immediately go into a story that's kind of related in some small way to the question. And knowing that cadence is super comfortable for me, because by the time I ask the question and people have already raised their hand, they're kind of invested now. And they yeah. want to hear the story and they want to know what the question has to do with the story. And even I'm like, oh, I hope I can connect the question to the story. But I love <laughs> that you're doing this because I think that it's a real it's a real challenge for people. And even those of us who are super experienced in this have been doing this for many, many years. You know, if I'm at a roundtable discussion and everyone is expected to contribute publicly, you really have to. You know, there's like that nervousness. You're like, oh, should yeah. I have another bite of my food or should I? <laughs> is, this my, is this my moment? And I don't want to lose my moment. And I don't want to be the person that didn't say a word. And so I think that it's it's great that you're doing this. Are you Have you found that public speaking and these other opportunities in terms of promotion or funding or uh, selling are connected? What do you mean from, from whose perspective? Selling, funding so, or selling? Right. Like if I'm a founder, you mentioned yeah. that there are very few female founders. There are very few right. CIOs in yeah. firms. There are very few equity partners. Are you finding that this is kind of one of those foundational skills that leads yeah. to these other opportunities? Yeah, well, because so if you think about um, visibility, I think it's it, it, we can only it's one tiny thing. Right. Standing up either on a panel or in an article or whatever is, is a small thing. What I've found is that in this case women they will find there are two things one they will always find reasons why they're too busy they don't um, they don't focus on their own promotion which i think men are this is a generalization men are typically in my experience better at that at brand are a brand whoever you know they men are better at developing their own brand and seeing that as important um which it is if you're going to become a senior person in an organization you know, your brand is super important, both internally and externally. And then the second thing that, again, in this case, women do, in my experience, is that they think that they're not capable of. So if, if you've got five things that, you know, it's that typical thing, if you've got five things that you need to be able to do and you can't do one of them, stereotypically speaking, a, a guy would go, oh, I could do four, whereas a woman might go, well, I can't do one. So therefore, I'm not really in the running. And I think it's helping people to on a, on a small level to start to learn that they are important their brand is important and that they can they can they can stand up they can even if they don't know everything about something you know they can stand up and they can um so I and I do think it it it, it contributes to um those statistics down the line because I think that from my own experience and you know you've had a ton of experience um as well when you start to say yes, that has a snowball effect, right? So when you when you do one thing, you you know that contributes. Then you, you saying yes to the next thing. 
one of the things that I have noticed recently, I've been at several events that were smaller, more uh, targeted events, is that those communities tended, at least in the last couple of weeks, I've been to the uh, Knowledge Management and Innovation Conference in New York and also the Master's Conference in New York, and there was an equal array of speakers. You know, there's a real diverse range of speakers, and I think that they have in some ways applied many of the skills that you're talking about. They're, they're experts, but they've done it enough where they feel as if they have a sufficient base level to talk about most things in a particular space, but yeah. also can anticipate what newer issues might be and would feel comfortable starting or engaging in a conversation. For example, if you're a very skilled practitioner in e-discovery or knowledge management, you can likely have a fairly informed conversation about artificial intelligence and the application yeah. to very nuanced issues, even if you don't know what the algorithm is doing or you can't describe the, the technicalities of how a large language model is specifically operating. So I think that the the speaking at the core is great and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see. So tell us when it is. It's the 1st of December um, and it's in London. Um, so it's being hosted by EY, um, which is so EY is our event partner, which is a great office that they've got in London Bridge. Um, so Didn't yes, we have was, a breakfast in at EY? You came to my breakfast. We hosted it at EY in London. And I think that. Were I you not in. Um, were you not. That was. Was that not Canary Wharf? Oh, it was Canary Wharf. It's a different place. Is it Canary Wharf? And you did. Sorry about that interference. Yeah. There, just there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was Canary Wharf, um, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. That was yes, great. Was, that was your breakfast. Yeah, it was, great. Yeah, this, was this, this amazing. Is you know, I couldn't believe great. you made the trip all the uh, way. And I was I was so moved. That was like <laughs> so many years ago now. I'm just thinking it. <laughs> It, yeah, it's it's really something. So although I've never I'm just thinking all of a sudden that I've never done a run in London, I guess because I don't really go to a lot of conferences in London. Ooh, I did one in that Amsterdam. Would be so that horrible. would be awesome. I would love to figure out. That's my goal. 2024 you host a run it. somewhere in London. You can so run. We'll so I used to live in London and you can mm. run. I used to run home from work when I was, you know, back in the day. I used to live in the East End in Bow. Yeah. Um, which is a fascinating area, you know, really cool. So, and I used to run from the middle of London along the river. So you pass Tower Bridge. It's beautiful at nighttime, especially it's all lit up or any time of day. It's just absolutely gorgeous. There's so many places to run. That would be so fun. Even I might come for one minute of your run. <laughs> you could wave. I would. Uh, yeah, I would like to see that. So oh, anyway, oh, but yeah, go on. No, no, no. I'll get an electric uh, bike. I'll come and just uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> a little scooter. Uh, I was just I was just thinking about these events that I mentioned only yeah. because we have recently been talking a lot about large successful events like Legal yeah. Geek and CleoCon and Relativity Fest. And the events I went to were significantly smaller, but were very sort of inside baseball. Like, you know, if you are an expert in knowledge management and are connected in that community, then being at that Knowledge Management and Innovation Conference by uh, Josh Fireman and, and Patrick Domenico, who were the producers of it, that was the place to go. I mean, it was a perfect event for you. And if you're very connected in the e-discovery community and litigation support world, being at the master's conference in New York was, was great. Drew a lot of folks, it was crowded, all interesting topics, very hands-on kind of use case sort of stuff like, what does technological competency actually mean anymore? If if the technology keeps changing, how can you possibly ever be competent? Because it's there's always a level that you're just haven't reached yet. And it was just a really interesting conversation. There were conversations about uh, you know using AI for uh, document review, and even at Patrick's uh, not KM and I conference, just wonderful discussions. Uh, between law firms and law departments, I really uh, it was really really interesting to see the the distinctions between the smaller events and the larger events. Not that the larger events weren't great, but no. I just uh, I thought it was interesting to see the the comparison. 
I mean, were those guys are the experts, right? Like they've been in the sector for for years and years. And I guess, I guess there's a such must such a different atmosphere in, with those smaller conference. Which presumably you got everyone. Was it small enough to have everyone in one room, right? Is that or was it bigger than that? That's right. There were some breakouts, right? But yes, there were tracks at certain points. They had a recurring track, right? that that allowed you they had four breakouts you could go to you know one at, during one period another during another period so you can get two out of the four right. but most of the presentations were in the main room and most of the people knew each other i would think yeah there were some new people but yeah it becomes a like sounds a bit cheesy but it becomes a bit of a journey the day right you're all on it together and and i find that so valuable like these big conferences it's great you see so many people but and there's lots of different options but those smaller conferences so was there with josh's and patrick's day what was the sort of recurring theme and was it gen ai or was it some like it, actually i thought they they threaded that needle very well uh so they gave an example there was the team at uh, Gunderson that was talking about their efforts in knowledge management and advanced tools. There were representatives from lots of other firms who were there. There was a general counsel, Mark Smolik, an incredible general counsel who was there on day two. Um, uh, Andrea Allison, who's at Faskin in, in Toronto, was there on day one. It just, it was a really nice uh, comparison. When I was at the master's conference, it was even smaller than the KMI conference. And there they had two different breakout rooms and it seemed like a simultaneous track occurring. And again, you could choose where your expertise was, what kind of questions you were trying to answer. And I felt like there was a lot of actionable takeaways. So that's why when I asked about the speaking, I was just like, what are the, what are the techniques going to be? When people ask me about writing, I wrote an article many, many years ago. It was called How to Write an Article in 30 Minutes. And it was a popular article because people want to know, how do I get this done within the amount of time I think is reasonable to spend? I don't want to spend a day, which is why I don't start in the first place. And a lot of these projects suffer from how do I get started and how do I show progress? GP2. <laughs> Well, right, right. And so if you if you showed people, here's my go to this site and ask this question and, you know, move forward from there. The question is one of trust. I was at a dinner last night with a bunch of leaders uh, in, in the market research space, and there was definitely a discussion about trusting the technology enough to even start. Right? Because if your foundation is flawed, the whole project becomes tainted. And that's a, I don't a use it. People always ask me if I use it. I I just don't. I mean, I think um I think it would probably take because we, we write for a living, right? So I think that it would probably take me longer to use ChatGPT and then unpick and change and get it to what I wanted it to be because in my own style. And even then, I'd probably be like, no, nah, I don't like it. I mean, maybe that's just being old-fashioned, but but um but so with the so with the your point about um was interesting about with the technology moving so fast is that anybody is that right is there anyone who's expert was that the well no no it was more of an issue that there's an ethical obligation to be technologically competent for yeah. lawyers who are licensed right. there's an obligation and the the there was some discussion about some of the rules being intentionally amorphous so that it could kind of be a malleable standard and technological competency in a small firm that it focuses on one set of issues may be different than someone that's handling a tremendous, tremendously valuable case with lots of complexity and has a series of tools. And, it, you know, you know it, so it's just a very interesting, it's not that they weren't expert, it's that that standard is evolving as the technology evolves. Lots of experts, no question there. But it was just an interesting discussion. And I felt like the people who were talking about it were themselves considered experts. And yeah. so we're able to speak from a position of how they experiment with technology, how they deploy it, what they mm -hmm. hold themselves to in terms of their obligations. And it was just 
a great array of, of perspectives that I think mm -hmm. were very valuable for the audience. It, it, it's interesting. So in the same way as um, sometimes when you're talking at a firm level about um, firms getting up to speed with Gen AI when they haven't even sorted out their core infrastructure, right? I think maybe with people, it's, it's an interesting point. Like, so with lawyers or whoever, there's a lot of organizations working towards getting, making sure that people can use technology uh, to a good standard, whether that be Word, whether that be Excel, if you need that, whatever, you know, like, and I think that that, there's still a lot of focus on on that, right? People doing things in the most efficient way and using the right technology at the right time. And it's, I've been having some interesting conversations with different groups who are tr trying to, you know, there's one that hasn't launched yet that I spoke to at Legal Geek, who they're very much going to be in the training people space at that sort of level. You've got LTC4, which is teaching people how, across different competencies how to use technology. And I, you know, I think, if you can focus on that, and there are some firms that are doing great stuff at an enterprise level with those organisations and really backing them and making sure their people, I think that's the, that should be the focus, right? Like you to make sure <laughs> make sure your people can use the technology they use on a day to day basis, right? And then you know, I mean, I know that's at a lawyer level, um, and that won't be helpful necessarily with other conversations, but as a principle get your core stuff right seems to be like for now as well as learning and I don't mean don't learn understand it, all the rest but just get your basics right <laughs> well there's also you know a question about where you should spend your time and what's valuable about your role in a particular situation it may not be that valuable to be the human being writing an outline or a human being producing an initial draft at this point but there are a couple of things I think in the next year, I'm already doing this in the fourth quarter here, but in the next year, you'll see a lot of people reevaluating where does it make sense for them to spend their time and their focus. And they will reassess what their roles are. I'm not in any way suggesting robots are taking over, but I do think that there will be a shift in what people are doing. I also think that people will become much more adept at learning in the moment, you know, this sort of just in time. Whenever I have a if I, for example, I'm not an expert by any means in Excel, but if I'm working on something in Excel and I want to do something very simple, I might just quickly go into YouTube and say, I want to sort this and do X in this particular. Somebody's there and has created a 30 second video that says, you know, click this button, go here, and they show me screen share. It's amazing. So the, the problem is some people are not even comfortable taking that step and we really need to push people there it's getting people to sit through hours and hours of training after they've done whatever their initial onboarding is has always been a challenge it was a challenge then yeah. it's a challenge now it's gotten more complex people are not even in the office i'm not sure you want to spend your time in the office doing that granular level of stuff but this idea of providing it when people need it yeah. it's the reason why chatbots have become so uh, effective and important because I just want to ask something find me this or is there a way I remember speaking to somebody from my podcast who uploaded a whole bunch of client alerts to the firm's chatbot and then people could do a search and it found all of this information you know offered it to a client or to as a resource and it was it was really helpful Really helpful. I I yeah uh, I used Excel to, to generate some graphs the other day for I don't know why it's not really my thing. So I, I had written a report and I wanted to make before we got it laid out by my proper graphic designer, like wanted to make it, it bring to light. <laughs> and then I've handed it over to my graphic designer who's working on it right now. And she's like, what are these reports? Like they don't even have the percentages in. And what does this line do? And I'm like, I don't know, Excel did it. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> so I can't talk. I can't talk. <laughs> Hey, before we wrap up, can I tell you about the session I saw this week? Yes, please. So so um, I uh, went to, a, we always talk about conferences, but there's such a great opportunity. You know, so many different. Well, it's conference, conference season. I mean, October it's is like conference, conference season. season. Yeah. So, but we, um, I went to Big Hand in London and, uh, you know, I have this thing about the keynotes at the beginning of the conference like being often really bad like so um they often in my article that I wrote about it this week I said they give me the ick because I'm quite young and cool like that like um and um 
but this one said we saw this guy Chris Barras Brown um Barres Brown I think I'm saying it right so he's um he advises companies like Diageo like Nike um he's um he's like a productivity consultant and he spoke to everybody I was a little bit late and I wasn't even gonna go um because I hate these things uh and anyway I sat there at the back <laughs> like a teenager um and before long, he got my attention completely because he was talking about um, understanding. He, he was saying that, that pe people are like cave, cave people originally, and we're not really suited for business. We're not really suited to do what we're doing. But um, obviously, that was a long time ago. But um, and he's talking about how people don't understand that everything we do is about energy and that your day and my day might be completely different because we I'm a morning person. I think you're a morning person as well. But everybody's energy is different throughout the day. And he was saying that you have to understand when your peak productivity is and use that to do your best work. Right. So use that time. Don't. And then he was he was talking a lot about co the conscious and subconscious mind. So saying that 80 percent of what we do is is um, on autopilot because we've developed to protect ourselves <laughs> we you know anything we've done before we will assume that we've done it in the same way so we'll probably do it in the same way um so he's drawing together all of these different themes about a understanding your energy b doing your best work but also you know understanding how your brain works and if you want to do something in a way that you might do it differently understand that a lot of what we do is on autopilot right the way we answer emails or the fact that we're scrolling through our phone will, will dip us into this sort of sub, into our subconscious autopilot and you've only got a really limited period of time during the day when you've got that highly alert conscious mind where you and that's the time when if you want to do something different or you want to do something really that involves concentration to do it in that period and then all the stuff that doesn't involve concentration particularly or you can do it you know, like the emails or ma potentially managing a team or whatever it might be to match so to be really mindful about how you spend and how you spend your time and when um and for me I am um, always get up at about 5 a.m. But I had got in the habit of looking at my phone and and it's, it was I suppose I didn't really shouldn't, shouldn't have needed him to tell me. But immediately by looking at your phone, you lose that clear, real clear, you know, time when you can do anything. So I yesterday morning, because I only heard him this week, didn't look at my phone and um, wrote an article straight away um, and didn't have any kind of didn't look at emails didn't have any interruptions and remembered how great that felt whereas I've got quite lazy lately about looking at my phone and some rescue dog oh he's been rescued oh <laughs> look how well he's doing right back to my work <laughs> and uh anyway and then and he was also talking about getting out getting fresh air you're great at this are you go for a swim or whatever amazing you are amazing you know this <laughs> and then taking the dog you know just structuring your time in a way that and also if you want to and then the last thing I'll stop banging on about this but he was saying about experimenting with your energy so he referred to this guy called Adam Moskovitz who made a lot of money with Yahoo lost it all in the dot-com bubble and then he used and then he became a hip-hop MC um, and then he used his his music as a way to rev revolutionize his family cheese business and he now and if you look this up it's been in Forbes and all sorts of stuff he hosts this thing called cheese invitational which is where he invites cheesemongers from all around the world to come to a rave in the warehouse it's all it's all over the country it's all over the US and with this backdrop of rap music they have competitions and and it's just like the weirdest and when he dresses up as a cow and it's just like the weirdest thing. But he said the energy, this, the speaker I saw, Chris Barris Brown, was saying we don't all have to be an Adam. But, the, you know, the things that we do differently and experimenting with doing things differently sometimes can produce the most amazing energy and different ideas. And that really, I mean, so I think that we should have a rave in a data warehouse is my conclusion. With, from geez, I just want everyone to know who's listening that. 
uh, Caroline was like moving. She was swaying to the music <laughs> that she was imagining was taking place in the background. And I really appreciated that visual because it was very funny. Uh, I, 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 I think this sounds like a great presentation. I'm not surprised. I'm a fan of, you know, Big Hand and, and their events. I will say that I read Atomic Habits for people who are interested in productivity. And it is easily the stickiest book I've ever read in terms of applying many of those principles. I mean, sometimes I will quote James Clear. I'll say, well, I missed it today, but I'm allowed to miss it one day. But if I miss it two days, then I've started a new habit and that's a bad habit. And it's it's fascinating. Or, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna align these. I, I, I can't tell you how many different things we have. Don't have enough time for this, but how many things I've connected together in terms of habit stacking. Yeah. to be more productive. I, I can only wish that I, I got even better at it, but I think, you know, keeping a streak going. I'm a big yeah. believer in streaks in terms of anything, playing my guitar, hosting my podcast, hosting the virtual lunch, as you know, like I just think that so many of those things can really penetrate. So I, I look forward to hearing how many days you go without checking your phone. Uh, you wake up. And uh, you're not confident in this. I can yeah, tell. Yeah. I'm super confident. I just know <laughs> the swaying gave it away. As you were swaying, I just thought she's listening to some music there or something. It's a, she's imagining a big block of cheese somewhere. This is fascinating to me. <laughs> I think that's got that's got to be the uh, the the way that we close out this week. I am as always honored to be chatting with my friend Caroline Hill. I am Ari Kaplan, and I look forward to seeing you again soon, Caroline. See you soon, Ari. Thank you.